All right, so we talk about white blood cells in this portion. This is when slides uh, 17 through 26. So white blood cells are called leukocytes, and I definitely want you to know that, that leukocytes and white blood cells are, are interchangeable. Um, they protect against disease, uh, which is a big thing. Again, these are your uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines kind of thing. Um, and Coast Guard, uh, you know. So anyway, and if I left anything out, please forgive me. But anyway, these are the ones that are going to be uh, protecting us. They have a limited lifespan. Most of them only uh, last, you know, a day maybe. Um, but they are, uh, we'll get into some that can live for a long time. But anyway, um, they're produced in the red bone marrow. That's where they originate. Uh, they are called the thing. The hormones that help regulate them are called interleukins. Uh, you can see that this has leukin in it, so you know leukocytes. And uh, colony stimulating factors are another big part of it. So it's uh, hopefully you understand that that's trying to increase their uh, rate of growth. So there's five types of white blood cells, and there are organized into two categories depend and these two categories are basically are there granules or not granules and so we have what are called granulocytes and there are three of them and a granulocytes and now since most of these are either latin or greek if you put a in front of something that means without so it mean it literally means those that have granules and those that do not uh, and just as, as a little side note, it's not anything that's going to be super important, but I just want to make sure you understand these agranulocytes a do have granules. They're just not visible. And so uh, the granulocytes, we have neutrophils, which are the most common. So we have the number one up here, the most common of the five, and then the eosinophil and basophil, which are the bottom two. Uh, so they have the, the, the granulocytes are the most common and the two least common. Um, the A granulocytes are right in the middle. These are lymphocytes and monocytes. And we'll look at each of these in just a second. So we start with the neutrophil, the most common of the white blood cells. The neutrophils, uh, while they are granulocytes, the granules in this instance are is not the, the defining feature. The defining feature is this, um, this weird-shaped, uh, multi-lobed nucleus inside of it. It's going to have about three different lobes that should be seen. On any picture that I would give you, I would make sure that they are visible. Um, just to point out, it's surrounded by a bunch of red blood cells. Again, hopefully you watched the first video. Red blood cells are the most common blood cells in the body or the fo common uh, formed elements of the body. Um, they make up over 95 or 98 percent of all the formed elements or whatever the percentage. It's kind of funny. I'm just laughing at the fact that I said red blood cells are the most common red blood cells. Oh, man, it's been a long day. So anyway, um, the neutrophils uh, are going to have this multi-lobed, weird-shaped nucleus. Um, that's why they are originally called, and you do not have to know this, polymorphonuclear leukocytes, which means multi, poly, weird-shaped, morpho, nuclear, nucleus. Um, so that it was a very good description of the cell. It's just it was a long, long name and most people didn't like that. So um, they make up, and I'm going to skip down here, they make up roughly 60% of all the leukocytes. So six out of every 10 of the white blood cells is going to be a neutrophil. So it's the by far the most common. It is the first to arrive at infection sites in general because it is the most common. And it is a phagocytic cell. They're called phagocytes. That means that they are, and if anybody's old enough to remember little Pac-Man, right, they are a little Pac-Man. And so when we have an invader that comes in that's trying to do us harm, uh, mean guy, grrr, uh, boy, it's hard to draw with this little thing. This guy's going to come along, engulf it, digest it, get rid of it. Uh, so they are what are called phagocytes. There's one other type of the white blood cells that's a phagocyte, and you need to know both of those. That is a big key on this. And the other one's a monocyte. We'll talk about it in just a second. 
It is elevated in bacterial infections. All right, that's kind of a big one to know as well. So neutrophils, um, most common of the white blood cells, they are a granulocyte and they are phagocytes that come to engulf bad guys. And in general, uh, it's gonna be where they are elevated in bacterial infections. The next one, the next one's called an eosinophil. Eosinophils uh, are another granule. Again, uh, so we have, if we have five white blood cell types, uh, eo, uh, neutrophil is the most common and down here on number four and five are the other two granulocytes. And so this is number four on the list uh, and it's called an eosinophil. The granules are the star of this one's uh, body. This is a, uh, these have very dark red granules. Um, they do have a nucleus that has multi-lobed. It's generally got two lobes, but you can barely see it through the big bright red granules. Uh, they defend against parasitic worm infections, but I'm not worried too much about that. I will tell you that farther along, you might need to know that. What I want you to know about them, and we'll look a lot more at this in the, uh, the lymphatic system. We look at our immune system. These are elevated in allergic reactions. So if you have allergies, these are the ones that kind of go haywire. Not worried about the numbers here uh, on the lab part. I went through a percentages of as you would see them um, and gave you a little mnemonic for that. Uh, you know, I would say that's good to have in the back of your, your memory about this. So they, these are the ones, they moderate allergic reactions. So when we have allergies that go haywire, these are the ones. And again, there's actually car, uh, cartoons, there's actually commercials out there now that are promoting medicines that will help regulate eosinophils. Now this uh, right here, just to point out these arrows, they, I didn't put them in there, that's from the book, but what they're pointing to are um, the platelets, the thrombocytes in there. Now I said this in lab and I hope that, uh, you know, again, um, everyone understands that this is not something that I am uh, pushing on anyone. It's just a way that helped me remember what things were and I hope it helps you uh, again, you know, hopefully it's not offensive to anyone. If it is, I, I'm sorry because I'm not trying to be offensive. I just want to help you remember things. Growing up as a Christian, I was taught that the blood of Jesus covered my sins. So when I took this and when I was in this class, I could remember the eosinophil was the red blood cell, uh, red, red granuled uh, leukocyte. So uh, if that helps, I, I, that's great. If not, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know what else to put. That's what helped me. So I'm going to move on to the next one. Basophil. Basophil, again, it's, it's granules are the star of the show and its granules are very uh, blue slash purple. Um, they are the least common. That's why they're called basophils. Uh, the word basal means bottom. That's why the stratum basal in the epidermis was the bottom layer. Uh, basal means bottom. So the basophils are the least common. Now, there are some things I definitely want you to know about this. First, the granules contain two types of chemicals, histamine and heparin. Hopefully, all of you have heard those two. You might not know what they are, but histamine uh, causes inflammation. And while uh, we look at it when histamine goes wrong as something bad, this is actually a good thing. Because uh, if I can cause, like let's say this is a blood vessel, all right, going to an injury, and so I've got some kind of jagged ooh, splinter that gets into my, into my skin. When they release this histamine, it's going to cause the blood vessels in that area to vasodilate and that helps bring more blood to the area so that's why we have inflammation now with more blood coming to the area i have a greater percentage of white blood cells coming to help so the neutrophils definitely come riding in on their uh, white horses to kind of save the day um, and heparin is going to be what they call a you know the the average person calls an uh, uh, blood thinner and, and 
you know, while that's acceptable to talk with people, that's really not what it does. It is an anticoagulant. It's, it stops the blood clotting mechanism because what would happen if that didn't, that wasn't released at the point of where the inflammation is, I would start having clotting factors released and then I would form a clot before the blood got to where it needed to go. Um, so those are uh, the basophils. Now, basophils and eosinophils kind of work hand in hand. We don't get into it a lot, but what I want you to know, but I shouldn't even bring that up, but what I want you to know about this is histamine and heparin, and it is the, the least common of all the uh, white blood cells. And so those are the three granulocytes. Neutrophil, weird-shaped lobe, multi-lobe nucleus, uh, eosinophil, red granules, basophil, blue-purple granules, basophil, histamine, heparin, um, and then the eosinophil uh, allergies, neutrophil, phagocyte. So now we're going to look at the agranulocytes. The first one is called a monocyte. Now, the monocyte is the largest of the white blood cells, all right? And you can kind of see uh, how big it is compared to uh, this red blood cell that's next to it. Now, uh, the key to the uh, monocyte is this kidney, it says kidney-shaped, I'd say kidney bean-shaped nucleus. It is a very large nucleus. It's going to be more than half the cell, basically. Um, it's not multi-lobed, it's just one lobe, uh, and it's usually this weird uh, kidney bean-shaped nucleus, and that's the key uh, to it. Um, this, both of the agranulocytes have a very unique uh, ability in that they can leave the bloodstream and live for a long time. So the, the granulocytes can leave the bloodstream, but they only live a few hours after they leave the bloodstream. These two can leave the bloodstream and, you know, live for, as it says here, weeks and months. Um, what happens when they leave the bloodstream, and I do want you to know this, that they change their name. Once they leave the bloodstream, they become what are called macrophages. So if I divide this up, macro means big, phage means eater. They become big eaters. This is the other phagocytic cell. So we had the neutrophils, which are a phagocytic cell, and now we have monocytes slash macrophages, which are uh, phagocytic. So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense as we're going through uh, this. And so uh, again, you, you will see the percentage on the lab stuff as we go through. But, so the monocyte is the largest of the white blood cells. It has a kidney bean shaped nucleus. Uh, it is a phagocytic cell that can leave the circulatory system and, and live for a long time. When it does, it is called macrophages. So for instance, when we get into the respiratory system, we're going to talk about macrophages than the VLI that are protecting us against the nastiness that comes in when we breathe. And so that macrophage is a monocyte. And then the last one, which is the king daddy of most cells. This is uh, outside of the neuron. Again, I say this pretty often. I think this is the most amazing cell. If you've ever heard of a T or B cell, that's this. They are lymphocytes. So lymphocytes, um, they, as you can kind of see, uh, you know, we just looked at the monocyte, how much bigger it was than a red blood cell. The lymphocyte is roughly the same size, a little bit bigger. Uh, the key to this and identifying it is, it is basically one big nucleus. All right, I'm circling the nucleus. I missed it a little bit on that. And you can see that it basically is this big purple nucleus with a thin little halo of cytoplasm around it. Um, they, this is the catch-all of T and B cells. You could not tell what that is uh, if you were just looking at it. Uh, there are certain things you'd have to look for. Um, now, we will look at how T cells and B cells work in another uh, chapter. Uh, T cells directly attack pathogens, where the B cells are what produce these things called antibodies. Um, now, the key to this is they can live for years, uh, decades even. These are the ones, this is what is officially our 
immune system. What we classify as the immune system is almost entirely lymphocytes. Most uh, immunologists or most people that are informed on the immune system, that are educated on the immune system, will tell you the lymphocytes are our immune system. Uh, and they're a, it's amazing what they do. So this is just a brief overview of some of the things that it can do. Uh, I, you know, I was going to go in and arrange these in a better order, but I decided not to. I'm leaving it as it was in your PowerPoints. But I'm just going to go over what these things are. Diapetesis is a word that you need to know. All it means is that uh, when a white blood cell, as it shows right here, uh, squeezes through the little crack, it's going to change uh, shape and kind of ooze out through there. Uh, that is referred to as diapetesis. Uh, peta uh, remain, you know, means foot or to walk. And so that's what it's saying is how it squeezes through to get, and it says then migrates towards the infection site. Now, what's going to happen is whenever um, and I just wish that I could organize this better now. Uh, whenever I have a damaged cell, they're going to release chemicals. Those chemicals will kind of go through and they will start affecting the inside of the blood vessel. So one of the first things it's going to do is it's going to affect these little, uh, they're called cellular adhesion molecules that are lining the inside of uh, the blood vessel. Uh, they're proteins that will help try to catch a hold of as the white blood cell is moving down. It grabs it basically and then causes it to want to move through or diapetesis through uh, the, and that's not the way you'd use that word, but you get it. It's going to move through the blood vessel into the tissue. And then from that, it's going to follow the, basically the chemical trail to find where the, the cell is injured. Once it gets there, it is going to eat, especially if we're talking about a neutrophil or monocyte. Uh, it's going to ingest the pathogen. Um, as it says here, neutrophils and monocytes are the most mobile and active phagocytes. Um, and we're going to look at how some of these work when we get in a lymphatic system because there's really some pretty cool things that go on. And also the other things going to happen is, and this is going to be mainly from the basophils, I'm going to have an inflammatory response that's going to help promote uh, the, the increase of white blood cells into that area um, by swelling and increasing capillary permeability. Um, so, and it's histamine and heparin that are causing that, like we just talked about. So those are the, the terms I would say that I would know uh, what you can with that. I am not, uh, I, again, I wish I would have organized it a little better. Um, so what happens is when I have a cell that something happens to, it's going to release this little chemical signal. Um, that chemical signal is going to affect uh, the blood vessels. The blood Inside the blood vessels, I'm going to have these protein molecules that are inside. They're basically going to kind of grab a hold of the white blood cells, cause them to squeeze out of the circulatory system. That's called diapetesis. And then they're going to follow the chemical trail. And so it's called positive chemotaxis. Inflammation is going to happen to that capillary to help promote this even more. And once that... that um, that white blood cell, whether it's a, a neutrophil or a monocyte, gets to that area, it is going to engulf what's going on, including with our cell. It's going to break down the parts to it and then analyze it and figure out if you know what needs to happen to that invader as we move forward. So that's kind of the functions of it. I hope that makes sense. This is a picture just showing a little bit of what's going on. Uh, again, these little green spots here are going to be the bacteria, and now bacteria multiply incredibly fast. So this is just showing a splinter as it gets down. It's punctured. Uh, it's punctured through. You know, you can see this is the epidermis. That's the stratum basal right there. It's punctured through that, so it's gotten into the capillary bed, and so that capillary bed is going to be fighting. Uh, at a microscopic level that we don't even realize it's going to be fighting a major battle to try and um, destroy the pathogens, as it says here. 
Now, white blood cell counts, uh, when we're looking at this, this is going to be very basic. I'm not going to get into a lot of the numbers on here. Uh, this is what I want you to know, that high white blood cell counts are called leukocytosis. Low white blood cell counts are called leukopenia. All right, I do want you to know those. I'm not going to get into the, uh, the numbers of it. Um, and that, you know, uh, know that the high white blood cell count can be acute infections and even vigorous exercise. Now, uh, if I lose a lot of body fluids, this could be, you know, way, you know, really exaggerated dehydration, but it also can be hemorrhaging, all right, um, can cause it to be high. Um, now, again, it's going to be high. If I lose a lot of body fluids, I concentrate things. So uh, the dilute stuff uh, becomes more concentrated. So it's going to look like it's high. Um, that, you know, that's why I, I always use cooking references. But you never season something that you're going to boil down before you boil it down because it's going to concentrate it. You put salt in a stock or soup that you're going to try to boil down, it becomes very salty. That's kind of what it's talking about here. That's what happens. Now, leukopenia, um, one of the things that I want you to, uh, obviously, anemia is going to be one of the things with it. Uh, I would want you to know uh, the flu uh, with it also is going to cause a low white blood cell count because it's uh, they're, they're doing their, what's happening is actually they're doing their job and dying too, as that's going on. Um, so anyway, so what happens is if we were to go back, uh, and if you remember, you know, I'm going to draw, try to draw a little test tube here. And so I, I have, um, blood in it and I do the, the centrifuge. And so it separates it into plasma on the top. And again, this is, I'm trying to draw the best I can using my little laptop here. Formed elements are on the bottom, right? And so uh, we said that was called a, um, a hematocrit. We look at the percentages to see if, you know, they add up, you know, make sure there's 55% plasma, 45% formed elements, roughly in that area. But what happens then is we take the, some of the, the formed elements, put it on a slide, and we start counting the number of white blood cells and the number of each individual white blood cells. That is called a differential. And so it's looking at the percentages and types of leukocytes, and that helps give ideas of where uh, the uh, where the infection might be, whether it's a bacterial or viral infection, or as I said, a parasitic worm. And so this is where that, that idea, and I went over this in the lab, they never let my engine blow. And again, these are real rough numbers. 60, 30, 8, 3, 0. Oh. And again, they don't add up to 100, and this is a very generic way to remember it, but that's what you would look for since uh, neutrophils are, um, you know, they respond to bacterial infection. So if all of a sudden I'm looking at this and I have an uh, elevated number of neutrophils, it doesn't tell me what's going on, but it gives me an idea that I, idea that I might want to concentrate on bacterial infections and cures for that. So that's what a differential is. It's just looking at the white blood cells and looking to see if we can get an idea of the percentages are right. And so this is a little chart showing some of the, the kind of generic things that we'll see where we'll have abnormal um, blood cells. So if we have elevated lymphocytes, what I want you to know, oddly enough, it's mononucleosis, all right? Now, I, you know, hairy cell leukemia, I do not want to laugh at a serious disease like that, but that's just a weird name. Uh, whooping cough is one of them, but if I'm picking one on this, I want you to know mono. Elevated eosinophils, uh, allergic reactions. Elevated monocytes, uh, TB. Elevated neutrophils, again, definitely no neutrophils and bacterial infections are, are interrelated. And if I have a decreased number of lymphocytes, specifically T cells, that is AIDS. So that's what I'd like you to know off of this chart.